Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a, a masterclass in Gogglebox, which is a show which in under 18 months, I think, uh, has gone from having previews saying it would be a new low in British television to almost universal acclaim and wheelbarrow loads of BAFTAs. Uh, joining me to talk about it and their roles in it, we've got David Glover, who's the head of Specialist Factual at Channel 4. Amongst other things, he'll be telling us why he commissioned it. Uh, Chantelle Boyle, the series producer, who, amongst other things, will be telling us how she makes it. Uh, we've also got Tim Harcourt, the creative director of Studio Lambert, who'll be telling us how he came up with it. And last, but very much not least, enjoying the champagne, uh, we have two of the undoubted stars of the show, Steph and Dom Parker. Uh, before we talk to all of them, before we go through the story of this show, uh, let's take a look at a few clips to show us why everyone loves it quite so much. Talking of those faceless people, so to get a BAFTA, Tim, uh, you know, 18 months ago, uh, this first one, and it's not the sort of show you think is going to win a BAFTA, is it? It's not top of the lake. It's certainly the first show uh, to show itself winning a BAFTA, that's for, that's for, uh, for sure. But yeah, it's an, ama it's an amazing um, trajectory. It's gone on from sort of seven or 800,000 viewers on that first night to uh, crowning it all off with a BAFTA for the, for the team and the stars of the show. It's fantastic. And David, you, obviously you commissioned quite uh, high-end things a lot of the time, quite in intellectual things as well. Uh, was this a BAFTA winner when you first saw it, did you think? Uh, no, I mean, basically, it was a weird little bit of an experiment. It was kind of interesting, um, on Twitter, before the first episode went out, people were just slagging it off before they'd even seen it, saying, this is a new low for British television, and kind of uh, just basically, Channel 4's disappeared up its own ass. It's a waste of my life to watch television. Why the hell would I watch other people watching television? So weird that Twitter would be wrong. That's unusual. <laughs> uh, now, before we'll, we'll go into to how it was come up with and how it's made and all that sort of stuff, before we do that, I'll just talk to, to Steph and Dom. How did you get involved in this? What was the first thing you, you, you ever heard of Gogglebox? Uh, well, we'd just done Four in a Bed uh, with Studio Lambert um, several months beforehand. I should point out that's a show, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Very definitely a show. Contrary called, to what you read yeah, in the papers. Absolutely. Don't okay. believe everything you read, almost. Um, and we literally got a phone call saying we, we're trying out this wacky idea for a new programme and we'd like you to be on it. Um, would, you, would you do it? And we thought about it very briefly and said yes. Well, we'd had, we'd had a really good time um, playing with four in a bed. It was like a two weeks busman's holiday. Um, and we thought, why not? You know, mm. to have some fun. And was there a moment where you thought, I mean, obviously you do it because you think it's a bit of fun, it's a bit of an adventure. Was there a moment during the series, maybe that first series, where you thought, hold on, this is something strange is happening here. We appear to have a hit on our hands. Did your life change somehow? Um, I don't think our lives changed dramatically at that moment, but there was a pivotal moment when I, certainly from my point of view, I thought, oh, blimey, this is really, you know, this, is, this, is, this has pushed the envelope right open and it's going to work when... I don't know if you guys remember, there was a, an asteroid that had come down and it had gone into the snow and there was this, this wee woman that was running around trying to find bits of the asteroid and she was trudging through the snow and Stephen, one of the guys from Brighton, said, come here, you've got to have a look at this, she's minge deep in snow. <laughs> and it, it, I was, that was it, I was... I was hooked. So you thought, there's, thought, your, there's there your BAFTA right there. There's your BAFTA, yeah. And why do you think the, the British public have taken to you two so much? I think if, there's, if there are breakout stars from this show, it's probably the two of you. Why do you think that might be? Because we're bloody marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was something. I knew there was something. Actually, should we take a little look at some of your uh, oh, go on, do moments uh, on, do uh, on Gogglebox, including do your reactions to Nigel Lawson. Uh, not Ni to Nigel, Nigel Lawson, to Nigella Lawson, uh, and, uh, and a flightless parrot. Let's take a look. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh. I think you might have appeared drunk on television more than anyone else in history, I suspect. Um, it's a wonderful show. It's done incredibly well. But let's, uh, let's go back to the very, very beginnings of it. Uh, Tim, uh, where did this first come from? Where were the first seeds of Gogglebox? Uh, the first, there was a natural eureka, there was a eureka moment for Gogglebox, or what became Gogglebox. Um, during the London riots, I live in London, and like everyone else, I sort of hurried home and put on Sky News or BBC News to watch, you know, what was unfolding on the sort of the summer streets of the city. And, um, and I just had, and I, we were behaving sort of, I don't know, slightly intensely. I was looking out the window all the time, thinking about moving my car. We lived in Finsbury Park at the time. We were worried the riots were going to spread up there. We were saying things perhaps more right-wing than we would normally <laughs> say yeah, um, yeah. about things that were unfolding. And it just sort of occurred to me that, oh, it would be really, really great if we had a camera on us as we were watching this news unfold, and if we had a camera on lots of different people from different backgrounds watching a news event unfold. Um, 
I wrote it down on my sort of ideas list on my phone as how we watch the news, I think I called it. Um, and then sort of like thought about it for a few more months. And when I joined Studio Lambit, I was, uh, you know, I'd thought about it a bit more. And, and, and what had kind of come out of it was the fact that, um, well, you know, it became a sort of a TV review show. But the fact that it came from that, that news area meant the need to turn around the show top, uh, topically and quickly um, was interesting. Uh, and we, I called it two, uh, 242 minutes, which was, I think, 242 minutes, which is the amount of time, average amount of time that a British person watches TV uh, in a day, believe it or not. In a day? A week. Yeah, I think so. Minutes. Just I assume week. episode two, series two might have been called 239 minutes and then 231 minutes. It would get yeah. awkward by uh, It was a terrible eight. title. It was a terrible title. There have been worse titles for it. Um, and I talked about it with uh, Stephen uh, and Tanya Alexander, who went on to um, exec the not to accept the show, um, and we had a meeting with David and Ralph Lee um, and Mark Raphael and Aisha as well, I think, um, and we sort of pitched it uh, to them as a sort of nascent idea, I suppose, and I said that, you know, the, the commissioners are always asking us what the national conversation is, and I said I didn't know what the national conversation was, but I knew where it took place. I think it takes place in front of the TV, and it's where people you know, catch up on the day, it's where they make up and they break up, and also it's where they watch TV and they react to the TV. And David, what's your, what's your memory of that pitch? Well, um, I remember um, Tim talking about the London riots, and I remember the London riots vividly, partly because at the time... Partly I was because in, you were heavily involved, David. Well, no, no, because, <laughs> oh, because I was living above a JD Sports at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> it was a memorable night for me. And, um, and I just thought it was a really interesting sort of... Uh, bizarre idea and there is a kind of rule that you almost except for the royal family and the simpsons or whatever that documentary makers never scoop up people actually watching tv and so i thought it was a kind of interesting area but also um when i was about eight or nine i'd watched a documentary from a psychologist who basically had filmed people watching tv and i remember that footage being funny and people would sing along to match the day theme songs the stuff we do in the show but I mean, there have been other attempts, none of them have been as good as... I think that was, that was the Peter Collett show, was that Open yeah. Box, which I think... That, should we take a little clip of it? Yeah, we'll That's uh, stuck in your memory. Mm. <laughs> in this week. So essentially, you, so you pitched a show, you think, you think it's kind of a review show, it's kind of a clip show, but also it's about how we talk, and it's about people, and it's about Britain. And so what was the next step from there once, uh, once they piqued your interest? Um, well, basically, we gave them a bit of money to do a sort of proof-of-concept mini-pilot thing. And basically, with a lot of these kind of slightly crazy ideas, we'll try and see if some glimpse of whether they'll work. And from the very first kind of small pilot these guys made, you could just tell there was something in this idea. It was much funnier than we thought it was going to be. And I mean, the goggle box to me, from a commissioning point of view, is like a hole in one at golf or something. It's sort of like, I mean, I miss so many times. And occasionally, just, it just bounces perfectly into the hole. And it's like one of those. There's so many unexpected levels of Gogglebox, which are just brilliant. But the pilot that these guys made showed that it was just much funnier than we thought it was going to be. And it's just a, it's a genius idea. Well, I think we can also we, we can take a little look at that. So a clip from the, uh, the pilot of Gogglebox. It's yeah. very different. Not very different, but uh, significantly different to uh, Gogglebox of today. Let's take a look. <laughs> it's kind of all there already, isn't it? Um, who, who, that, uh, who was that family? They were called them. the Glovers. They were um, a sort of a left-wing Liverpudlian family who, uh, you know, well, yeah, same name. Yeah, no, they're no relation, although they look like members of my tribe. <laughs> and they've got that sort of the same tribe. sort of stomach and, um, so, yeah, basically sofa-dwelling people. But they pulled out, sadly, uh, before the show. And we, could, we tried to talk them back, and they were trying yeah. to say, like, are there any relation? Maybe you can phone them up, but they're not. Oh, so really? They why, did they, why do you think they pulled out just... I don't know. I wouldn't. I would probably be libelous to speculate. Yeah. Oh really? Are they regretting it now? <laughs> no, I don't know. I've no, no asked them again. I think. Oh, have I've you? Asked them again. They should come back. Does it, come back. Does it, I think turn your phones of every series. I saw does Leon and June there, but any anyone else survive from the pilot? No, Leon and June were the only people who survived from the <laughs> the pilot. There was a great outtake of Leon in the pilot that we didn't actually use of him talking about uh, the eight prettiest women in Maine and Chelsea, just sitting there going, Ah, oh, Kagi, she's lovely, <laughs> and Millie. So we, 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 he, he, he was gold from the beginning. And what else is different uh, in that pilot? What did you have to well, change? Well, it was a list show. It originally, it was a top 10, kind of top 10 shows of the week. 
as a way. We were worried that people wouldn't stick with it because there's no obvious narrative or yeah. there's almost no format to it. It's kind yeah. of so loose. And that's one of the beauties of it. But there was a discussion about whether it should be a list show. But yeah. Che didn't really want a list show. Stephen Lambert wanted a list show because they tend to be sticky. But we, it was so good, we didn't even need anything like that. I mean, at one point, we tried to make it, you know, Monday's programs first, Tuesday's programs, to go through the week. But we don't even need that. Yeah. It's just a weird thing. It just works loose. Excellent. And Chantel, this is when you came into, into the thing to actually make the series. So you presumably saw that pilot. I did, yeah. And did it, did it have weaknesses and strengths for you? Yeah, I, I could see the potential in it completely. Um, at the same time, I was getting a lot of criticism from colleagues and friends saying, are you really going to work on a show like that? Um, but um, yeah, I believed in it from the very beginning. And the first, I joined the team six days before transmission and walked into an edit and saw this material and had no idea how we were going to get it on air. But, um, but we kind of just you know, went along with it and played to its strengths, which was the comedy and the emotion. It's worth remembering, isn't it, quite how sniffy people were about it before it went on air. Can you remember any of the, the criticisms? Mm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Did your friends, Steph and Dom, were they having a go at you for doing it? I mean, totally. I mean, what the bloody hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> really? um, well, I mean, not, not before it went out, because nobody had seen it. No, but when we told them we were doing it, they just said, are you mad? What, what is the matter with you? Why on earth? I remember my sister going, well, it was a bad idea. I wouldn't, really wouldn't do it. No, no, no. And, you know, look at it now. It's fantastic, but on paper, it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It doesn't work. Like and most so, of my commissions. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to go there. <laughs> we'll get to but, sex box later. Um, <laughs> But it wasn't great to start oh, thank with. You. I, I mean, I, I think my, my mother uh, saw the first show, we saw the first show, and I thought, hmm, not necessarily sure I'd watch episode two, but I'd give it a try. <laughs> episode two. I bet you didn't say that at the time. I do, I did say that at the time. We sort of looked at each other and thought, well, what the hell have we done? Yeah. Maybe Lissy was right, perhaps we shouldn't have done it. But episode two was better still. And you thought, well, actually, not quite so bad. Episode three, <laughs> a lot better. And then I think by episode four, you know, it was a done deal. It had found its groove. Mm. It's mm. changed. Mm. I think probably if you look back at episode one to now, mm. totally different. Mm. You know, it, it's not just about the emotion. Um, it's about the relationships within the groups, yeah. the family. So it's well, the apes in the cage, how they're getting them. on. Yeah, you, you, you become, to, you fall in love, or you have a relationship with these people because you get to know them yeah. really well, like most people have got to know us. That's it, we go to love the soap opera of it. And, and Chantal, talk us through the casting process that brought, because there's some brilliant people on the show, Don and Steph obviously uh, included. Yeah, so basically we have a team of producers and APs that go out and walk the streets. It's never been advertised, it's just literally going to bridge clubs, which is where we found Leon. Um, we had to convince, he was up for it straight away, we had to really convince June to do it, um, which was ideal. The people that didn't want to be on the programme are still, and don't want to be on the programme, are still the people we want to be on the show, and that's what makes it quite difficult to cast. But, um, yeah, so we just walked the streets, and that's, we're still doing it now, we're trying to add more families and more households. Um, yeah, and then their film, checked, checked by you guys, the channel. And David, presumably the casting very important for... Channel 4, because I mean, it's, it, could be a channel, it could be a show on any channel, this, essentially. It could work on any channel. Uh, and did you want the casting to bring a Channel 4 sensibility, or what was it you were looking for? Um, well, there's a few criteria. In a way, one is um, you just obviously want it to be an amazing cross-section, because obviously if totally different households are saying the same thing, that's interesting, or if they're saying different things, it's interesting. And well, the main thing about the casting, the first thing is you have to be able to read who they are from the very first shot. It's almost like Harry Enfield kind of sketch shows. You almost need to sort of say, OK, I get these guys immediately. And then, but again, it's lucky in, in some senses in that we find that people watch TV with the people they love. So there's a real warmth about the show. Yeah. And there's a kind of way in which kind of the people, you know, kind of they have their, their dynamics as they sit around each other. People have natural comedy timing, like you've seen with these guys. But lots of the households are just much funnier than you'd predict. And there's a kind of, there's a beauty to it. So again, it's a kind of, we went for certain criteria and obviously diversity and all that sort of thing, uh, but not, not for the sake of it, but because it makes the show better, you know, I suppose. Um, but humour, and the other thing we look for is people being kind of unfiltered, <laughs> not afraid to say what they think and just shout at the TV or say anything <laughs> like these guys, uh, don't really hold themselves back. <laughs> so one of the casting processes sometimes they do is they hold up a photo of the Queen or Simon Cowell 
And if they're just rent, at, you know, <laughs> that's a good sign for us. Well, that's the interesting thing, because once, obviously, it's been out for a series, you then know the impact it's already had. Does it, ch does it change how you watch the television? Does it change how you perform? Does it change how you are and some of the other uh, contributors, do you think? Um, it certainly opened my eyes to a lot of television I would normally not have watched, um, Educating Yorkshire being a very particular one that resonates with me. Um, and, you know, some of the more hard-hitting documentary-type things, um, I just wouldn't watch it because I don't want to be brought down. But do you feel less but natural, perhaps, these days, or do you think you're still... I, from watching that, I think you're, you're still you, but there must be... The temptation must be, oh, they liked that thing last week, perhaps I'll do that again, rather than just I being I can't yourself. remember what I said no, last there you week. Go. That's the advantage of being drunk, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, well, I don't remember. That does sort of rather help if you've had a few drinks, but... No, I, I, I mean, you know, there have been all sorts of accusations. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm yeah, about quite right. ready for it. <laughs> um, I'm keeping count. It's quite impressive yeah, so far. Um, <laughs> but the first, thing, the, the first thing Dom said to me before we came on was, I can smoke on there, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No ashtrays. Um, no, I, no, I don't think for a minute it's changed how we watch television or anything, how we do it at all. Um, we're completely, I think, probably the fact, because we have a few drinks. Um, right, and it, so it's you. quite a long time of filming. It's, we don't, we, in our lives, we don't have the time to think about it, to make it up, to pretend, to plan yeah. anything. We literally, most of the time, we're running late for the filming schedule, and Sally's probably <laughs> hanging around going, where the <laughs> fuck are they? The they you know, they're yeah, doing, yeah. Dom's yeah. still in the pub, Steph's still in bed, you know, they've got a tough, <laughs> busy day. And we crash straight on into it, and it, and it, when, I think when, when it gets difficult, I mean, Sex Box was, was fantastic to watch for us to that, rip That, of course, apart. was a David Glover commission, Sex it, Box. Yeah. Uh, didn't go down brilliantly on the show, uh, Well, it? I just think the cameras were on the wrong side of the box. Definitely. <laughs> it would have been far more entertaining. I don't know if you saw it, but it really was pretty I was obsessed level. with the health and safety issues, though. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's literally like watching another episode of Goggle Box. It is. Now, though, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, this is one of the things that basically, the it's worth saying, actually, is that basically... Every time one of my programs is on Gogglebox, I'm so excited, thinking they're going to like this one, they're going to love this one, <laughs> and they always brutally murder it. They always savage it. Every is there single a message program. there? Do you think? Yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's weird that day because everyone else seems to get away scot free. In fact, let's take a look at some of your uh, some of your shows. Well, it's not savage, just my shows. We? This is Channel Four shows. Channel Four shows. Uh, we've got some yeah. Channel Four shows Instant being deniability. murdered. <laughs> so also, my colleagues always get excited when their shows are going to be featured on Gogglebox, and producers sometimes say, "Will you do our show?" But be careful what you wish for, yeah, because yeah. this is the treatment we dish out. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Heavily sex box dominated this session. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. I, I did tweet once, I said, I'm glad Pointless is on so early, so they can't do it on Gogglebox. And people said, oh, you're fishing for them to do it on Gogglebox. Oh, no way. That'd be awful. Can you imagine having your show on it? We I, are honestly, so doing it'd be it. the worst, don't you dare. <laughs> it'd be the worst, <laughs> worst thing in the entire it's world. That bloke that sits on the right, he's rather dull. Have you not? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's <laughs> Bloody know all, isn't he? Yeah. He knows everything. He doesn't he's, know, he's on an earpiece. Oh, is he? Yeah, that's what I've heard. <laughs> that's what I've heard. Uh, one final note about casting. Final note about casting is there's some churn in the casting now, isn't there? There's people who drop off and there's new people coming in. What's your sort of policy on that, or is it, is it, is it no hard and fast rule? Well, we make it up as we go along. Basically, it's always good to try and introduce new people each series. But in a way, as you say, the, kind of the current cast is kind of loved. So introducing new people, often the viewers don't quite take to them. So if we do, we will have new cast coming back in the next series. But, um, you know, kind of new cast as well as the old cast, but only a few. And we're going to try and do it so when they first open their mouths, they say something absolutely hilarious. So they've yeah. got a chance. Because basically, it's almost like some new people moving into the community. Yeah. Our current cast is kind of loved. But I think it's important to fresh it up. Otherwise, they'll just become monsters, our cast, and they'll start oh, yeah, no, ordering us around exactly and just that. sort of like making insane demands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know. it's, it's literally like a negotiation on stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I think the fees have just gone through the roof. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, I, think, I, I think the opposite, Dom. I, I, I don't think know if you were listening. Yeah. But, totally. uh, I mean, we, we're, we're well listen. aware of the fact that you know, our days on the show are numbered. Oh, don't no, say no, that. No, don't no, say no, that. no, 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 no. They, you know, in, in due course, you know, but I, I think the casting of this show, from my personal point of view, is quite an important aspect. I think it's an important show because it's the nation talking to the nation. Mm -hmm. And we're, we have, I think we've been very well chosen, not, not us, but the, you know, the grouping. <laughs> we are all fairly tokenish. You've got the black girls from Brixton, the gays from Brighton. Every demographic. You know, almost there, every yeah. demographic. You've got the Indians from, from up north, the posh couple from down south. What is, I think, if this were to fall into the wrong hands or be mismanaged, can, can be the controlling of a yeah. fairly powerful tool yeah. 
of actually speaking to the nation, rightly or wrongly, honestly or dishonestly, um, and attracting other markets that you haven't got. You know, the fairly soon you need someone who's Irish to get the Irish viewers. <laughs> Are you going to be having someone who's Arab to get the Arabic viewers? Somebody Scottish to be bringing in. I don't think you can say that. <laughs> no, I'm, but if no, you... No, he's accusing, he's accusing David not, of racism. He's I'm not accusing, no, I'm, I'm not accusing. I'm not accusing. And Jewish, where, where are the Irish, uh, where are the Irish viewers, <laughs> It's no, a very important demographic for us, which we'll be chasing shortly. Well, exa exactly. I mean, the, the, the power sort of behind the scenes of the show to decide who they want to watch it, who isn't watching it, who needs to be brought in to watch it. I mean, I'm sure... But it's, honestly, it's not there. that professional, Dom. I promise you it's not. But it's I'm, just I'm, me and these guys saying they look funny. Or will one day sit down and think, who's not watching? Who do we need to... But you don't really want that, though. You want it to be instinctive, and you want well, it to, people think just to love it because the they love it. Well, I think you want the whole country to watch it. You want every human being <laughs> that would be nice, on a Friday it? night at <laughs> 9 o'clock to stay home and watch Gold Box, isn't it? And, and then your advertising revenue would go through the roof. Right, be quiet now. <laughs> Fundamentally. So Tim and Chantel, let's go on to how this show is actually made, both technically and, and, and creatively. So you're about to shoot another series now. Yeah. Um, we know what the format is to the show. Creatively, do you try and refresh it? And then uh, let's talk a little bit about how you actually film people in their homes. It's very interesting the way those shots are done. But creatively, do you, are you looking to refresh it? Um, I think the best thing about Gogglebox so far has been that we haven't really changed it. It's evolved slowly, but we ha we've, it kind of still sits as the same show it was. Um, so probably not, not to my knowledge, but... Um, I'm basically, there's, I think there's a slight sense of being interested in the cast, as you say. So kind of, there is a slight sense of it being like a Truman show with the community. Mm -hmm. So we try and put lines of commentary in just to say kind of Leon's you know, weight loss class is going well or Basit <laughs> Siddiqui's just had a kid or whatever it is from the sublime to the ridiculous just to kind of keep people updated. I feel it's a bit like being a, a GP or a paper boy or something going around all these different houses and saying hello to them all. So I quite like to keep up with how they're doing. But essentially, no, we're not going to change it. It's pretty much as it is. Mm -hmm. And from a technical point of view, how, you, how, how is this show actually filmed? What's the, what do you put these people through week by week? <laughs> um, so um, every night for five nights, we have five producers who go to five different households, and they shoot about six hours' worth of material. Um, so we deal with about 180, sometimes more. <laughs> we deal with about 180 hours' worth of rushes over five days. Um, and we have six edits that start on Saturday and people work all the way through the weekend and just, we cut everything we shoot, every single programme. So each household will watch three one-hour programmes and the news every day. Um, and we don't know what's going to be the best stuff because it's such a fast turnaround, so we cut everything. And the show comes together every Wednesday morning, myself and the exec, Tanya, sit and look at each other and go, we haven't got a show, we haven't got a show, we haven't got a show, and David's coming at midday tomorrow. <laughs> um, but that day, the show completely just comes together and lasts sort of 18 hours. And Often they've been up all night when I arrive. It's quite a weird thing. They're so dedicated to it because they know they've got now millions of fans waiting to see it. And so when I, when I come in on Thursday morning, they've often, usually, they've, no one's slept, they've been going around okay. the clock. Just totally kind of, you know, insane drive that this team has to make the show, which is amazing. I mean, it's kind of incredible. And how late can you cut in news events and stuff like that? So it's quite powerful when, uh, when it covers news events. On a Tuesday night, that's our last night of um, shooting, which was the night that Nelson Mandela died. So it's all kind of just, you know, we were there and we got those real moments, real reactions. Do you think that the, it's essentially, I mean, I think entertainment producers are fairly aware of how their programmes are watched and how they're consumed and, and that people are looking there and looking there and slagging it off and whatever. Uh, I think maybe for news broadcasters and news channels, it might be uh, interesting for them to see how the news is watched and how the news is reacted to. Uh, do you find that, David, sometimes when people are watching things on the news, you think, goodness me, this is, it's, it, it's quite, it tells us something, I think, about British people when they're watching that topical stuff. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, definitely, in a way, that's the genesis of the idea was from the riots. And the first series, we came off air the week before Mrs. Thatcher died, mm -hmm. which was kind of gutting because it would have been amazing just to hand over the whole show to do a show in reaction to Thatcher's death. But it is kind of, there's something about our show which is a bit like, like monosodium glutamate is to food flavours, that we take this incredible material and then we put this extra layer of people's reactions on it. And sometimes it's spine tingling, like the Mandela death, or things where you just cut, sometimes we just cut silently around all the households to news reactions. And you can just sort of feel like you can hear a pin drop in every household as they come to terms with it. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, the, the, the main, another kind of extra level that I certainly didn't predict was how emotional the show could get. 
at times. And you get it with news, but you also get it with documentaries. And there have been times where I've turned up and been in tears watching you guys in tears. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of... Uh, watching someone's reaction to something gives it an extra level. There's a story about um, a sitcom where an editor edits it and the producer goes, this isn't funny. And the editor goes, well, that's not my problem. That's, that's, your, you know, that's your bad show. And the producer goes, no, you think the joke is on the Del Boy saying the joke. But the, joke, the laugh is actually on Rodney's face and the reaction. And similarly with emotion, I think, that you get this extra level if you watch Musharraf's speech in Educating Yorkshire and you cut to these guys and they're not fooling around, they're, they're really moved. And that's kind of where the, the show really takes off. I agree, it's that shared experience, isn't it? Mm. That, that shared humanity as well. Yeah. But there was a, there's, there's an amazing clip, I think we've got it, um, when you were watching Coronation Street, mm. the particularly oh, emotional yes. episodes. Let's take a look at that. Oh, I'm going myself, David. <laughs> uh, all human life is there, isn't it, is, is, is the truth. It's a, it's a wonderful vehicle for that sort of thing. Uh, you're comfortable being emotional watching those sort of things. It's actually quite cathartic, isn't it? It's quite nice because, it, you know, it's, it's a lovely thing for everyone to share as well, to see that other people react in that way. Um, I think it's a nice thing to watch. I don't think it's quite nice to go through it. I mean, I think that's the beauty and the magic of television is that it can make you feel things that you ordinarily wouldn't necessarily think in that moment. Um, I think sharing your vulnerability is, is a gift, and I think that's, that's to be respected. Um, I think when I've, I, there have been a couple of occasions where I've watched stuff that I literally am bawling my eyes out and I've had to stop filming and run away to the loo and you know, put my face back on and get my shit together because I've got a, work, a job to do sort of thing, but um, that's the power of television. Are there specific Simply examples that. of that? What's the worst thing you've seen? Um, there was a, a 999 bit when an old boy, um, his wife collapsed on the sofa and <coughs> he didn't know that she was dead and he was sitting there whilst they were trying to resuscitate her and I found that utterly gruelling um, to watch this old boy process that she'd gone. Um, that I found very difficult. And another one, again, about the, the age, aged actually, about um, a chap who'd lost his wife and he was still sitting, her chair was empty, and he was still sitting next to her empty chair and kept looking at her empty chair. I mean, it was just, it was just absolutely, it's such powerful, powerful television, so simple. And after that, David, you monster, you make them watch Sex Box. Yeah. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> but the warmth is very important. I think people come for the comedy and they, they stay for those moments where you really, you find out about people, don't you? That's one of, one of the key strengths of it. Um, now, people have talked about uh, this. Obviously, there's some fantastic comedy on this show, some brilliant comedy. People, people have accused you of having script writers. Some of the really? people. How the hell do you script that? Seriously. Quite. Anybody. I challenge anybody to script that. How, I mean, how can anyone. Can me. Yes. Uh. You know, Lady Mary, <laughs> Lady Mary's um, you know, arms, short arms. People have tweeted me and said they can't watch Downton anymore because all, <laughs> all they can think about is this woman with the short arms. Um, you know, it comes from this sort of weird part of your brain that I don't think anybody else has got, so it does make me a bit But, Tim, has that, that sort of thing been on your radar? People say, oh, there's people playing up for the cameras, it's all made up, all this kind of stuff, the cynical stuff. I don't think so. I remember, I remember Tanya and I showed Stephen at the very early stage um, just one house, about 15 minutes of it, and Stephen was like, oh, my God, it's terrible. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and we kept on saying to him, no, but when you intercut it, it will be funnier. And I think... You know, th th those little snippets seep to, they, they kind of amplify each other, really, don't they? And they become funnier because they're in juxtaposition with other people talking. Actually, if you take them in isolation, you know, they are the little zingers of, that we all make on our own sofas, really. Mm. Um, and they just seem a lot funnier because they're stacked up against each other or something funny stacked up against something sad. So I, I think um, it, 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 comedy writers would perhaps feel slightly aggrieved at the thought that, you know, they, they, they couldn't do better. I think they're, they're, they're completely different types of humour. Carolina Hearn and Craig Cash, who narrate the series for us, yeah. obviously wrote The Royal Family. They're like saying, if it is scripted, we'd love to meet the script writer, because yeah. it's better, the, the reality is better than any one script writer. You know, in a wicked way, I don't think we should mind if people think we're writing it, because we'd be well, geniuses if no. we were. No, people, <laughs> we're people always do anyway, don't they? I think it is, it's made in the edit, it's an amazingly edited show. Yeah. Is it, so is it, it's never won like a craft battle or something like that. They no. always give that to Top of the Lake, you think, like, really? Whereas this is a show that you've, you've got all those hours of footage and very, very quickly turning it around. You're making this beautiful, very clever, very funny, very warm show, which is, that's the art of editing, isn't it? I would have thought. Yeah, uh, it's a huge hit, so a huge hit for you as Studio Lambert. And how are you exploiting that now? Is it going around the world? 
It is going around the world. Um, it's been it's the third season's about to go into production in the States. So it's on Bravo, which is slightly different from Bravo was here in the UK. It's sort of a female skewed, you know, ABC One network, um, cable network. Um, and it's about to go into the th third season there. I mean, I cut, I, I cut together a tape to show it to the Americans. And, um, and I, I'm, my sort of angle was, imagine if, you know, the family from Duck Dynasty or, you know, Larry David and people like that were on the sofa, but um, they just sort of cast a whole load of Californians, basically, <laughs> wannabe actors and stuff like that. And, um, and, and it's good, and it's got its own kind of internal humorous logic. I, I, hand on heart, the British version is better. But it has sold in other countries. I think France are about to do it, Germany, uh, Australia, uh, Denmark, Israel. Canada's uh, has just done a version, so it's sold about 17 or 18 mm -hmm. countries. But in, term, in, ter so in terms of Studio Lambert, though, I'm often when you set a quiz show, it's very, very uh, uh, prescriptive on what they can do, and it's got to be exactly like yours, but because it's such a fluid idea, you're sort of happy for other countries to do it in their, with their sensibilities. It, well, it, it, it would, it would, I'm sure Tanya would love to, like, go to all 17 countries <laughs> and, like, completely control it. And, uh, um, and, and do you know what? It might be slightly better... It was like that, but um, I think it will work better in some countries than others. Perhaps quiz shows have a slightly more sort of uh, greater universality, maybe, yeah. than this. It might just work in Northern European and Scandinavian and Canada. Well, in, in the edit, to, sometimes sorry. we see a Chinese delegation walking through trying to learn how to rip it off, basically. And they kind of write down, you know, fat man sitting in corner <laughs> with wife. And then apparently the Chinese version is copying it. You've got yeah. doppelgangers. They've probably got two yeah, rich yeah. Chinese people I love to see that. But basically, also one of the oh, dreams is when all these things are up and running, I've got to negotiate <laughs> this actually, when it's all up and running around the world, I really hope if we have big international news stories, the president gets assassinated, we'll be able to cut to Beijing sofa and yeah, Ukraine sofa, yeah. you know, just only for big worldwide news stories, but we'll be able to go around the world to all the sofas. Nice. So that would kind of be interesting. Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that'd be right. I think we can take a little look, actually, at the, the American one, which is called, is it The People's Couch? The People's right? Couch. The People's Couch. Let's take a look. Goodness, I would pay good money to see Leon and June on that show. I tell you, that would be great. Uh, you, you fancy a, a, a week in, in the States, being a, having a little guest slot on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't mind. I think I'd slot in on that stage quite nicely. Only if that stripper comes as well. <laughs> I think he does. Yeah. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So just to sum up, just from each of you, why, what is it you think that has made Gogglebox the genuine uh, hit it's been, David, as the... Uh, as the commissioner. I think there's a, we're talking about the warmth, I think it's also the truth of it, that basically everything else on TV, to me, often feels like it's been PR'd out of existence. And it's sort of like someone's told them a bit what to say and it's a bit controlled. And I love the fact that Gogglebox is just a little bit of truth where these guys can say what the hell they like about politicians or programmes or anything that comes across the screen. So I love it for, for its warmth and its truth. And Chantal is a programme maker. I think it's, the sense of community that the programme gives you, it's um, being able to access, like, if I was 15 and I didn't know how people lived in a certain part of the country, I'd be fascinated by it. And I think that people are generally quite nosy, looking into people's, other people's living rooms and finding out what they think and sharing it and, and sort of um, sharing that. Yeah, that is that basically that. And is it fun to make as a programme maker? It looks it. It's amazing. It's, yeah. um, it's hard. It's really hard. The, the, the hardest part about it is making it look easy. But um, you're never kind of sitting looking at the rushes, twiddling your thumbs, bored. It's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, these things don't come along too often, do they? Uh, yeah. Tim, as the, uh, as the man who actually came up with it in the first place. I mean, I agree with everything that these guys have said. I think, also importantly, I think, you know, it's current. It's, it's the week we've all just lived and, you know, whether we watch those programmes or not. And, and secondly, I think it's, it always feels fresh because it's always got a, a new, you know, a, a group of programmes to... to prey upon or enjoy or whatever you want to um, think about it but um, and, I, and I hope that's, that that will speak for its longevity that new, new shows it feels to me out. that it could, it could live forever it's one of those I shows could, I think another 20 or 30 years David I mean, but it could do couldn't it because you know there's, the TV programmes are going to still be made and as the stars of the show uh, yourselves aside just looking at the others and how they're watching what do you think it is about the show that is absolutely connected with the British public um, from my point of view, I would say, without a shadow of doubt, it's because it's such an inclusive show that um, regardless of where you live, regardless of your social background, regardless of your history, your education, what have you, 
um, there's a unity to this show that everybody, at most of the time, are all thinking the same thing about the same things. And that kind of brings us, I know it's so cheesy, but it's true, it brings you all together and you feel like, you know, yeah, we are bloody amazing as a nation. And yeah, we agree with each other. And, you know, we, we must be right because they think it's, it's right as well. And yeah, what unites us is, is more important than what divides us, isn't completely. it? Completely. Matt, you've really made a dent in that champagne bottle. That's extraordinary. <laughs> uh, we we've got some time now. We've got about 10 minutes left, a little bit less for some questions. Anybody got any Just questions for uh, anyone on our panel? Yep, here. Do you need a microphone? I can chat here. Hello, um, my name's Rosa. I'm a kind of factual fact and AP. It's actually for Chantal because Gogglebox has just become the holy grail of casting and every job I've done since it came on our screens, my producers and execs have said, we want Dom and Steph from Gogglebox or... Everything is based on people from Gogglebox, which has made my life a lot harder, so thanks for that. Um, but I wanted to ask Chantal, what advice do you give your casting team? I mean, what do you say to them to help them find brilliant contributors? What is the golden rule for you? There really isn't one. It's just a case of um, whether or not those people are genuine, um, opinionated, and most importantly, what the dynamic is in that family, in that household, whether it's a family or siblings or or um, you know, grandmas and grandparents and stuff. It, it's about the dynamic. It's how those people get on together um, when they're sharing that experience of watching a TV programme that's really key. Thank you. It's also people that you wouldn't normally necessarily find on TV. There's a kind of way in which we try and put people on the show where you might not see in any other TV programme. Kind of, you know, there's no reason for them to be on TV. So Sandy and Sandra, for example, in Brixton, or you know, there's various people that somehow they're kind of, uh, they're a bit like that. They, they street cast as well, don't you? You kind of, uh, they just mm -hmm. walk up to people in the street or in pubs or in parks that look interesting. So they don't, and they don't advertise for it in the, it's not kind of Big Brother wannabe casting. Mm -hmm. Anyone that wants to be on the programme too much is probably wrong for us. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's like that. It's kind of, we want people that are sort of uh, real in some way. And how do you persuade people like that though? Because by their very nature, they're people who wouldn't really go on television. Is there, is there a particular skill? Um, it's easier now because people have seen the programme, but certainly at the beginning, um, the Siddiquis and the Young and June, once they saw the show, had reservations, their family had reservations about it, um, because they realised that they don't all share the same opinions necessarily within programmes. Um, but it's just a case, we've got a very good relationship with our cast and they trust us, and it's just a case of them sort of being along the ride with us and enjoying it and trusting us. It's also weird, especially because people are becoming famous. <laughs> so we've got this kind of like the, the Tapper family were, were telling me that they went to the Ideal Home exhibition and they had a row as they often do and a small crowd gathered around them. <laughs> and so what, and they look at them, look at the Tapper family around, it's brilliant. So they, that's getting weirder, but we'll probably just go with that. Okay, another question. Okay, one, one, one right down the front here. Don't rush. Um, to the program makers and yourself, um, if you were to appear on Gogglebox, what programs would you like to watch? What programs would you loathe to watch? And how do you think the British public would take to you? Well, you'd, you'd be brilliant, David, on, on Gogglebox. <laughs> um, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, sort of, I've thought about it a bit. Um, in terms of what programs I'd like to watch, um, I mean, there's one thing we can't do ever, which I, I watch quite a bit of sport, but we can't fair deal, because we always have to fair deal stuff. It's a bit of a boring answer. There was, I was thinking about where, what I'd be like on it. Um, um, I'd probably be a bit like these guys. I'm <laughs> quite out of it often, <laughs> some evenings. And, um, and basically, there was a weird thing. I was thinking about that, having the same thought that you're having. And basically, someone had given me a weirdly, taken a photo of me. So behind me on the sofa, there's a photo of me. So it just looks like if that was me on the programme, I'd look like a real egomaniac. You yeah. know what I mean? He would cut yeah. to my house, commissioning editor, with a photo of himself behind him. <laughs> um, but basically, I'm not sure the public would take to me, truthfully. Um, it's a good reason I'm, not, I'm behind the camera. Um, how would you guys be, be on it? I think Stephen Lambert could be interesting on it. Yeah, mm. definitely. With just kind of stacks of cash he could sit on. Yeah, he could, he'd watch it from a Scrooge McDuck tip. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Think, yeah, he would. Okay, so perhaps time for one more question, one last question. Up. Hi, just a couple of quick questions about the mechanics. Um, do you tell the 
families which programmes they have to watch, and so might they be programmes that they wouldn't normally watch? And how does that impact on the show? And how do you actually film it? Do you have a crew in the room, or is it remote control cameras? Um, so we have two cameras that are rigged at every house every t uh, for every shoot, um, one on the fixed wide, one on the reactions. Um, and we have a mini gallery, which is set up for four people. We, it's live logged. There's a field producer, camera operator, and stand operator. Um, they could be in the spare room upstairs or one of the kids' bedrooms or the dining room, whatever it may be. Um, and it's ran from there. And we have a little radio. The produce th that team never walk into the, um, into the living room, the families. Um, so we don't want to sort of burst that bubble. So, one, and the, the families, I think you can probably vouch for, you sort of forget the cameras are there because we film for such a long time each evening and that's when we get our best bits. Mm. And in terms of, we do, we do make them watch the same programmes. We couldn't just wait like natural history filmmakers hoping that they turn on the same channels at the same time. So, but a lot of that's done live because the BBC or whatever won't give us advanced copies. So we basically, you know, we'll do those big shows live. Well, you know, guys know more about this than I do. But basically, and then sometimes we'll say, we'll send out a preview. But it's all made that week, and we force them to watch shows. And so quite a few of our families complain about the amount of news we make them watch. And party political broadcasts go down like a lead balloon. <laughs> um, but I always enjoy that. It's always funny watching them slag off the politicians. But basically, uh, that's true, isn't it? But that's the only intervention mm. we do, really. That's the only thing we do. We I think tell that's them. a really positive intervention because so many people now just watch the shows that they know they always watch. Right. And so you're actually doing something that people haven't done for many decades, which is going back to watching things they wouldn't expect absolutely. to see. And that's probably one of the real strengths of the programme as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, we do get to watch a hell of a lot of shit. <laughs> <laughs> And on that bombshell, uh, <laughs> our time's up, Tim. Uh, new series starting. 26th of September. 26th of September, yeah. new series. Thank you so much to David, Chantel, Tim, and of course to Steph and Dom. Thank you all for coming Thank as well. You. Thank you.